Well, thank you for uh, having me. It's always a pleasure to uh, to come to Seattle and, and uh, uh, see everyone here, and, and tremendous prestige and honor. So, uh, so we're going to talk about the osteoporotic spine and the aging population uh, and uh, patients with uh, deformity. Uh, so these are my disclosures. So uh, as you can see, uh, the aging spine is something that we're going to be facing more and more as time passes. Uh, briefly, if you look at this slide, in the year 2030, uh, we're going to have 8.9 million uh, in comparison to 4.2 in the year 2000. So over that 30-year uh, shift, uh, there's double the, uh, or more than double the amount of uh, patients that are over the age of 85 that we'll be encountering. So, uh, so given that we're going to be seeing more and more uh, elderly patients, you know, what are the problems that our elderly patients have? Well, as we all know, elderly patients have problems with their spines, stenosis, spondylolisthesis, scoliosis, uh, spondylitic myelopathy, uh, fractures, compression fractures, you name it. So these are the problems that we see. Uh, and we're just going to see more of it because we're going to be dealing with an increasing uh, population of, of elderly people. So uh, a survey of, of over 100,000 Medicare beneficiaries uh, found that heart disease and lung disease and back pain were the three most important uh, things impacting uh, the physical health status of older Americans. And so, uh, you know, that comprises about 20 to 30 percent of people over the age of 65 have back pain as a fundamental problem. So, again, very common reason to see their primary care physician and hence very common reason for that patient to get referred to us. So, as you can see, uh, you know, the range is, is well within the 20 to 30 percent range as far as people having uh, significant back pain uh, uh, in, in the uh, ages of over 70. So, uh, so uh, what is the incidence of spinal stenosis in patients that are 60 to 69 years? There's a range, 19 to 47 percent. Uh, you can have spondylolisthesis in 10% in of elderly women and 4% of elderly men. And uh, important to see that degenerative scoliosis is even more common than spondylolisthesis. You know, we all see numerous spondylolisthesis patients, but scoliosis is actually more common. Uh, so uh, uh, looking at the lumbar fusion rates uh, escalating, uh, perhaps is related to the aging population as we see more and more pop, uh, patients uh, having degenerative disorders, degenerative scoliosis. We learn more and more about uh, the relationship of our uh, pelvic parameters to the spine. We see more and more of a need to do uh, instrumentation. And, and uh, so you can see that the fusion rates continue to increase. So uh, this is uh, I'm referencing one of Dr. Koswick's uh, articles uh, looking that at uh, intravenous pilograms, and uh, they reviewed 5,000 uh, uh, pilograms, and they found that there was uh, uh, scoliosis in 2.5%. Uh, further uh, studies have been done, and, and uh, there's a prevalence of scoliosis uh, in other series of 7.5%. And uh, uh, however, if you partition those patients into those that are less than 45 versus those that are greater than 60, uh, scoliosis was present in 15%. Um, so, uh, so you can see as, as we get older, uh, degenerative scoliosis is, is very, uh, very common. And so, uh, you know, one of the things, though, that, that we must realize is that as we advocate for surgical treatment, uh, in the uh, de aging scoliotic population is that uh, the older you are, the more likely you are to develop a complication. Uh, complication rates are, uh, can be as little as 28% or, or as high as 80%, uh, depending on uh, how much you scrutinize uh, your data. And uh, uh, patients that were over 69 in this Dobbs uh, study uh, were uh, nine times more likely to have a major complication complication than those patients who were less than 69. So again, you can see 
uh, you know, despite the fact that we're going to be doing more and more fusions in the aging population, we've got to also counsel our patients that uh, you know the surgical treatment is is associated with risk. And so, you know, why is uh, dealing with the elderly population an obstacle? Uh, obviously, the biggest obstacle is uh, the material that we're working with, uh, the poor bone quality. Uh, and uh, with uh, decreased ability to have good fixation, uh, we have increased difficulty achieving fusion uh, with poor bone quality. We want to add more uh, uh, levels to the construct to distribute the, the forces in a more uh, broad manner. Uh, and that makes it harder to achieve a fusion. The more levels you fuse, the more likely you're going to have a pseudarthrosis. Uh, 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 the poorer the bone quality, the more likely you're going to have proximal junctional failure and, and kyphosis. Uh, so basically, we need to come up with constructs that can overcome uh, the physiological demands uh, of the patient and the weakness of, of, their, of their anatomy. So, uh, so uh, uh, you know, you, just by looking at plain x-rays, uh, you can get a very good glimpse of, uh, of whether or not a patient has poor, poor bone quality. And I just chose this one in particular just to demonstrate that if you look at those end plates uh, and you see uh, that those end plates are a lot darker than the cancellous bone of the vertebral body, you've got to be suspicious for the possibility of poor bone density. And you've got to uh, start ordering DEXA scans, check the bone density to prepare yourself for the surgery. Uh, you know, it's very often in... A, uh, an MRI will be very bright uh, in the center and very dark at the periphery. That also is a, indicative of, of poor bone quality. So there's a simple things to look out for to help prepare yourself. Um, you can see in this construct, uh, uh, there's been distal pullout strength. This patient has severe osteoporosis. Uh, the uh, preceding surgeon before I saw this case uh, attempted to augment these this fusion by putting in cement, but you can see there was leakage of cement uh, into the venous system, and, and hence the distal aspect of the construct did not have any cement, and, and that's where she pulled out, and, and that was obviously a failure. Uh, so uh, stress of the bone screw interface is going to lead to loosenings around the screws. We all have seen have seen uh, patients with loosening screws, and and. Uh, uh, this is especially common in patients with, uh, with uh, osteoporosis. So, uh, you know, in patients with osteoporosis and poor bone quality, uh, is there a way uh, around, around dealing with this? You know, can, what can we do uh, to potentially uh, improve fixation quality uh, in patients with poor bone, bone quality? Um, so one potential... Uh, uh, technique uh, is to choose uh, a fixation in the lumbar spine where you can choose a more cortical trajectory. Uh, whereas doing the standard uh, lateral to medial approach in standard pedicle screws, uh, there's recently been uh, descriptions uh, and some case series of performing what we call a cortical trajectory where you start uh, at the midline of the pars. Uh, and you project from the medial to lateral perspective. So uh, th this is uh, an article from Santoni, one of the earlier papers describing this. Uh, and you can see that the, uh, the purple uh, uh, trajectory is the standard pedicle screw trajectory, and the red trajectory is the, uh, the cortical trajectory. And you can see that you start more medially. Uh, you point in a cephalad manner. Uh, the entry point is going to be in the cortical bone of the pars. And so uh, uh, this study showed that there was increased pullout strength with the cortical trajectory. Uh, looking at that as a possibility, uh, uh, I saw that as a potential opportunity uh, to uh, use this technique to treat patients with osteoporotic spines. And uh, before doing it in osteoporotic spines, I figured it would be very relatively easy to find osteoporotic spine specimens. Uh, you know, we all go to cadaver labs, and very often uh, the cadavers are osteoporotic because they're elderly. And uh, so I found that uh, that would be a, an advantage in this study uh, in order to uh, 
uh, test the efficacy of cortical screws in osteoporotic cadavers. And so that's what this study was. And so basically we found eight specimens, all of which uh, had uh, uh, T-scores and DEXA scans demonstrating osteoporosis. And we uh, subjected them to fatigue testing and pull-out strength. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, setup. This was done uh, with uh, Brian Cunningham, uh, who at the time was uh, at the uh, uh, University of Maryland St. Joseph Medical Center. Uh, and uh, so you can see uh, this is the technique for uh, measuring pull-out strength. Uh, you can see uh, uh, cortical screws uh, in comparison to pedicle screws uh, had decreased segmental uh, motion and rotation in comparison to pedicle screws. Uh, and uh, that was both uh, also for the uh, uh, minimal segmental rotation in the neutral zone testing, uh, that the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, this was uh, comparable to cortical screws and pedicle screws. Uh, but the most uh, interesting uh, part of the study was uh, looking at the difference of cortical screws versus pedicle screws uh, uh, based on the level of the spine. So if you, if you look uh, at this slide, you can see that cortical screws did better at L4 and L5, whereas pedicle screws did better at L2 and L3. And the reason for that is because if you look at an L4 and L5 pedicle, you have a lot of cancellous bone. And if you choose a standard 6.0 or 7.0 screw, which all of the pedicle screws selected for this uh, study were 6.0 or 7.0 screws, uh, uh, a 6.0 or 7.0 pedicle screw is going to fill up the pedicle mostly at the L2 and L3 level. Whereas at the L4 and L5 level, uh, a 6.0 or a 7.0 pedicle screw is not going to fill the level. And so it was at that uh, point where we realized that this made perfect sense because the cortical trajectory was getting into the cortical bone of the L4 and L5 pedicles, and hence uh, it was engaging with stronger material, whereas the standard pedicle screw in L4-5 is sitting in the middle of a large uh, area of cancellous bone. So, uh, so, so this, the uh, cortical screws were either 4-3-5 or 5-0s, whereas the pedicle screws were 6-0 and 7-0s. And uh, uh, despite the difference in the diameter and dimensions of the screws, and despite the difference in the length of the screws, you can see the pedicle screws were 45 millimeter screws, and the, uh, the uh, cortical screws were typically 30 or 35 millimeter screws. Uh, they, they still had uh, similar uh, uh, peak loads at, at failure. So, uh, you know, so that was. Uh, potentially it's going to become more common, and I think uh, uh, especially in patients with osteoporosis, it may be something to consider. Uh, uh, I'm quoting another one of Dr. Kosowitz's uh, studies uh, looking at the potential uh, to augment the spine with cement. Uh, and uh, I think we all have had patients where we know that upon insertion, of the pedicle screw that the insertional torque is minimal and, and uh, it would be ideal to have better uh, insertional torque and uh, one way would be to uh, uh, insert cement into the uh, pedicle before you uh, uh, instrument that pedicle and also to uh, augment the spine above the cephalad aspect of the construct to reduce the chance of developing uh, uh, proximal junctional failure cephalad to the construct. Uh, other technologies, unfortunately not available in the United States, are expandable screws, uh, where you, uh, uh, similar to uh, toggle bolts and, and drywall, you know, you can see uh, how, how that, that's very similar, but, but it, it it's, uh, makes sense. Uh, you have fenestrated pedicle screws, where you can put the pedicle screw in and not have to worry about uh, uh, cementing the vertebral body before you instrument it. So you can instrument and then cement. Uh, unfortunately, these are not available uh, 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 in a non-label fashion uh, in, in the US. Uh, so uh, a couple studies, however, from Europe, Boriani uh, uh, evaluated uh, cemented uh, pedicle screws and uh, found that uh, the cemented cases did 
uh, a lot better than the non-cemented cases in patients with osteoporosis or uh, uh, bone that was uh, 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 influenced by the presence of tumor. Uh, further uh, indications that cementing uh, reduces in a significantly uh, lower rate of lucencies around the screws. Uh, uh, this is a uh, study uh, demonstrating 29% uh, uh, lucency around the screws versus 71% lucency. So it's, you can see a pretty profound uh, improvement. Uh, Kibesh uh, at Hopkins, uh, down the street from where I am, uh, uh, studied this in, in the cadaver model uh, and demonstrated uh, that uh, at the upper instrumented vertebrae plus one, when those levels were cemented, that there was uh, markedly fewer fractures at, above the construct. Uh, and uh, obviously with uh, the upper instrumented vertebrae, the peak load to failure was uh, at a higher uh, level. So uh, very uh, potentially useful. Uh, so I'll give you an example of a case that I have had, uh, uh, an L2 to S1 fusion. Uh, this patient uh, uh, had a history of that and required an extension up to T11. Uh, as little as two months after surgery, however, he had severe pain at the top of his construct, and you can see he developed PJK. Uh, the rods were somewhat more prominent, and. Uh, you can see uh, he was uh, particularly complaining about his back when he would drive, and he was a relatively uh, slender individual and, and didn't have a lot of tissue uh, uh, behind him, so he, he definitely wanted uh, intervention. Uh, so uh, 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 we uh, did an osteotomy at that T11 level uh, and extended up his fusion to the T8 level and cemented uh, the vertebrae, uh, and uh, this this patient has not had a failure. I've followed him for for two years now, um, so he's he's actually doing okay. So uh, I showed this patient actually. This is a different case. Uh, this was the patient that had that severe failure of the distal aspect of her construct, where the surgeon had attempted to uh, augment the spine with cement. Uh, however, he was unable to augment the distal levels because there was leakage of cement. Uh, at the middle point of the construct, uh, a very uh, sick lady uh, with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and osteoporosis. Uh, uh, in, this, in this individual, uh, we did a pedicle subtraction osteotomy uh, uh, at the apex of her kyphosis, and uh, we were able to, to, uh, to correct that uh, and, uh, 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 before and after you can see, um, and uh, so again, this is a, a patient with osteoporosis, uh, and uh, part of the reason for her failure was the fact that her bone quality was poor, and perhaps not enough uh, levels were uh, used to provide adequate uh, distribution of the forces. And uh, furthermore, the, the deformity was not corrected during the index procedure. And so I feel like if, with a patient with osteoporosis, if you fuse them into a state of kyphosis, they're very likely to continue to have a problem. And if you have someone with a significant deformity like that with osteoporosis, they're going to be better off if that deformity is corrected. So, uh, so uh, if that deformity is corrected, what you're essentially doing is decreasing the stress of the bone screw interface, uh, and uh, that potentially will lead to uh, uh, improved uh, outcomes. So uh, what about biologic considerations in patients with osteoporosis? Uh, if you have a better fusion and if you can accelerate fusion, uh, there's less uh, stress at the bone screw interface. Uh, perhaps uh, we could consider the use of uh, something like BMP, which, which uh, obviously uh, facilitates uh, fusion but is uh, off-label. Uh, and uh, is controversial. Uh, uh, iliac crest bone graft, you must not forget that. That's uh, been the gold standard uh, to improve uh, bone healing and arthrodesis. Uh, but obviously one of the issues with iliac crest harvesting is the potential for the development of morbidity related to its harvesting. But, uh, but that's the uh, 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 one of the most useful ways to ensure
uh, bone fusion and healing. Uh, uh, the other issue is, is uh, you know, we're all have pressure to finish our cases uh, very quickly and timely. Uh, do we spend an adequate amount of time doing the decortication? You know, we might spend a lot of time doing a very good decompression and, and uh, a lot of time making sure that the instrumentation is perfect, but uh, how much time do we really spend on making sure that the bone surfaces uh, are going to be amenable to effusion? Uh, so I, I think that we need to focus on that and really take that seriously and not just uh, uh, let that part of the case uh, go uh, without a lot of uh, attention being devoted to it. And uh, the other issue is, did you adequately assess your patient prior to surgery? Uh, did you check their vitamin D levels? Uh, you can see that uh, in a spine practice, a routine spine practice, uh, 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 there were significant rates of uh, vitamin D deficiency uh, between 57 and 27 uh, percent were either uh, deficient or inadequate in their vitamin D levels uh, prior to uh, undergoing uh, elective spine fusion. Uh, so, so that's something that could be optimized prior to surgery to help improve uh, this process. Uh, you know, uh, teriparatide is medicine that will help improve bone density, uh, but it's one of the few medicines that improves bone density and improves bone fusion. And most of the bisphosphonates, as you may know, may improve bone density, but are actually bad for bone fusion. Uh, whereas Forteo uh, or teriparatide is, 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 uh, is different. Um, so uh, there's a study uh, from 2012 demonstrates that uh, uh, there's an accelerated fusion rate uh, in patients undergoing fusion uh, when that medicine is implemented. So what about any, any good news? Uh, you know, all of this has been mostly bad news. You know, the good news is that uh, you can still expect to see uh, good outcomes uh, in elderly patients undergoing scoliosis surgery uh, despite the high incidence of complications. You can see that the elderly group in this study uh, of, uh, uh, was uh, highest in the complication rate. Uh, however, uh, if you look at uh, their outcomes, the elderly group uh, had the greatest amount of improvement uh, in, uh, in the pain scores. So, so uh, the latter columns are the elderly uh, group. So, so the elderly patients are, have the most to benefit from surgery, even though they also are uh, at the most, have the most risk. Um, so further uh, study from uh, Steve Glassman uh, demonstrating that uh, clinical uh, outcomes in patients over the age of 65 uh, did not have any different in outcomes at two years uh, uh, based on the complication rate. So despite them having higher incidence of complications at two years follow-up, there was no change in the outcome. So, so it's just something we got to warn our patients that, yes, you're older, you're going to have a complication rate, but it shouldn't affect your long-term long outcome, and you still have a lot to potentially, to potentially gain from the surgery. And one final note is uh, just to put things into perspective, uh, looking at Medicare dollars, uh, when we prescribe uh, uh, epidural steroid injections, uh, you can see we're spending uh, a fortune on epidural steroid injections. We're spending a fortune on physical therapy. Uh, however, just look at a posterior lumbar fusion. It's, it's a minute amount of, the, of money that's being spent when you compare it to the other treatment modalities. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, we just need to advocate for what we do, and uh, you know, as spine surgeons, uh, we do have uh, effective uh, treatments. Uh, and you know, while we do think that they're costly, and they are costly, they're uh, certainly uh, not as costly as all of these other treatments. Um, so, so there is hope uh, for us. Uh, so, uh, so degenerative uh, spinal conditions obviously are, are very common in the elderly. Uh, uh, we need to come up with ways to potentially improve uh, what we do by seeing uh, ways to improve uh, at how we deal with patients with poor bone density. Uh, uh, you know, we can have 
successful results in the elderly despite the high risks uh, of complications. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's increasing data that demonstrates that these uh, uh, treatments are cost effective uh, as long as you have long-term follow-up. And, uh, and that's it. <laughs>